how are you reconciling that being the 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 voice for caring for a woman's heart, but then privately destroying the woman you had at home? Resentment. That was the denial I needed. It was like you would do anything and feel like you you right in doing it if you feel hurt enough, pissed off enough, disrespected or taken for granted enough. These are a lot of the things that I was saying to her, like, man, you taking me for granted and nothing to do with nothing physical or superficial. It was like how much I'm sacrificing for you. Love is a treasure chest, but once opened, our hearts become vulnerable. I, I went back to Vegas. It was this guy. He appeared as a friend. Sure enough, it led to infidelity. Alignment can't be ignored. We talked about certain topics while I was having kids. She didn't want to have kids. Um, and that was one of the red flags. And I know you desire marriage. So I think it's best you move on with your life. What you do, hold on, Lisa, what you do? I told him, okay. <laughs> she didn't ask me why. <laughs> I knew several other women's bodies better than I knew my own. I've, I watched their videos of them having sex, so I would try to imitate that. No discussion is off limits. Dear Future Wifey Podcast brings healing. You inspire us to try God a little bit more. Up and through this platform, I have realized that it's possible. It's possible to love again. The conversations have really helped me to change my perspective on relationships. Season 7 is all about tough topics. I'm Latarius R. Winfield, and welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latarius R. Winfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. We're trying to hit 500K subscribers, and we're about a little less than 70, 75,000. I don't know what, what it'd be at this point. 75,000 away. Uh, thank y'all so much for the exponential growth that we've experienced on the Dear Future Wifey podcast in just three years. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all so much. If you're listening to us on streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you name it, make sure that you leave a review and um, make sure that you subscribe on Apple Podcasts and receive downloads every time we drop one. Well, this is part two of the episode, You Reap What You Sow, with my homie, Derek Jackson. What's going on, brother? Nothing much, man. So the first episode was pretty good. How you feel? I feel good. I feel comfortable. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know that you uh, you ain't going to bite my head off. <laughs> I was a little bit nervous, man. Do, do, do you feel like you, that you coming here with a little bit of guards guards up? You, you made a comment. You was like, hey, you thought that I had DM'd you uh, prior, like a few years. We say what year? 2014. 2014. I said that was my boy Bache. Okay, okay. Shout out to Bache Williams. Uh, you said I reached out to you about uh, using Dear Future Wife. Yeah. And you said that at that time you was a hothead and you was like, what? Man, forget you. <laughs> forget you. He Praise said, the Lord. He said, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Man, look, I've been doing it, so you ain't going to tell me. No. Nah. <laughs> yeah. I ain't know what you was on, man, but yeah. um, I appreciate you, darling. It's like, this is a really good conversation. Yeah, that was Bache that sent that to you, but shout out to him. Uh, he actually uh, talked about on my previous episodes. He actually gifted me with the trademark for Dear Future Wife. That's real. So shout out to that brother. Uh, so, yeah, so we're at the point in the conversation where you were contemplating calling off the marriage. What happened for you to decide to go forward with the engagement? Um, I just felt like it was too much pressure. It was like, we're getting close to the wedding. Of course, the stress of that. Um, I think she was still pregnant. She was pregnant now with my baby boy, Derek Jr. And I'm like, it's so much on the line. And then on top of that, I'm doing my thing um, in my career. So we had sat down maybe a little bit before this and mapped out a plan. Well, I mapped out a plan with her. Because most of the stuff that I had done from the first book to the initial, whatever, was in my single stages. So this is the first time we're going into this chapter together. And I'm like, I got you by my side. This is what the, what the play is. We're going to do this, this, and this. And then in the next couple of years, we're going to be able to just be in, you know, phil uh, philanthropists and be multimillionaires and whatever. So at this point, I'm making multimillions in my 20s. So she already know what's up. So I didn't want to abandon You're ship. You're making multimillions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my 20s, I was making multimillions. Um, glory to God. But, so so that, that was that was the stuff you were doing relationship and other businesses you Other had. businesses. I had other businesses. Out. I so still you were balling out of control in your 20s. I want to say balling out of you control. You was balling. You had millions of dollars. Well, the thing about business, man, even when you got millions of dollars, you got IRS, a lot of expenses. there's expenses. You know, if I placed an order for, so one of my products was a date night car game. One order might be a quarter million dollars in order to get the warehouse right. And then you got trucks. You got, you know, a warehouse. You got payroll, 70000 a month. 
But the, the biggest thing was- Hold on. You ain't going to just throw these numbers. Your payroll was 70000 a month? Yeah, man. At its height. You know, it fluctuated depending on who I had on. But if I had a marketing director or whatever, it was, yeah, about 70000 a month. So you was running this like a for real, legit business? It was a, a for real, legit business. Yeah, yeah you, you wasn't just sitting up there saying, oh, I'm, you know, you know, I'm doing this like a little mom and pop stuff. Just doing, you had, like you said, warehouses. Yeah, man. Yeah, infrastructure. Um, but I still had to work to make money. And so for me, I was like, I want to be home. I want to be home with my babies, you know. But the first couple years as they're infants and toddlers and we sitting there game planning, I'm like, it's going to look like this, this, and this. I'm going to have to grind. Um, I'm putting some stuff together so we can have residual money. And then with that, we're going to have – we had this whole plan, basically. Multiple homes. Mama's coming down and moving. Um, and I was like, I don't want to abandon ship um, from all of that. And, of course, the pressure and so on. But, man, we were, we were breaking down toward the end, man, even in the engagement. And then what made you press forward? Exactly what I said. The, the pressure, the plan. The, the plan, like don't give up on it. Like somehow, some way, we still got to make this work. And then how'd you recalibrate and say, let's get married? Um, honestly, we just went through with the wedding. You kind of riding that high. Her uncles came down. Unfortunately, her dad had passed, so he wasn't there. But that male presence was there on her end. A um, little bit before that, I had talked to her mom. Me and her mom didn't have the greatest relationship, but she gave me a blessing to marry her daughter. Um, so all of this stuff just felt like it was coming full circle. So on the wedding day, my mama there, my uncle, my girl, everybody on both our sides of the family is there. It's beautiful. And it's like, all right, maybe now we can kind of wash away some of the stress that was going into here of planning the wedding and all that and get back to the plan. We're going we gonna to save the world and we're also going to break generational curses and we're going to raise up these beautiful children. And what happened? Not that. Um, <laughs> the, it was about a good week or two. I was having a honeymoon phase, a honeymoon break. But again, I was still, just my experience was, okay, I clearly haven't been perfect. Actually, in the engagement, it was after the, the counseling session. I went and had lunch with a girl. And that's when I got kind of shook, like, man, you can't go back. You can't go back. And I didn't sleep with her, but I, I, that was cheating. That was totally, you know, wrong or what have you. So um, you just, all you had lunch. You didn't get a hand job? Uh, no, 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 nothing. Head, nothing just no, like, but we had we had texting and stuff, so I had an inappropriate com uh, conversations and stuff like that. Was but that somebody you messed around with in the past? No, never messed around with her before. Um, but it was a girl I was clearly attracted to, and I knew better than to go and even have lunch with her. And I went, you know, sneaking around and stuff. So at Did this, you have plans to smash? Keep it 100. No, it, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm trying yeah. to think back. But this is, you're talking about 2017, six years ago. Um, I absolutely would have if we right. got into the same vicinity. Uh, but at that point, I was just in my feelings. I was just in my feelings and I, and like, man, I just need to get away, be around a, a female, whatever, whatever. But um, yeah, that was in like mid-2017. So cut all that off. Going forward, um, I may have had conversations with girls at most, but like the worst thing about me is I was still maybe a flirt, maybe responding to something like that. But now that we married, okay, there's no chicks or whatever. You know, we, we focus. We got this plan. It's 2018. Um, and we're still having a ton of disconnect. We would come together for a little bit, and we would be intimate, and we would be friends, but we're disconnecting a lot. And this is going into the birth of our, uh, our son. So, again, I'm thinking pregnancy emotions. It's, da -da -da -da, it's always something. But then on my end, I'm just wearing thin. It's been a year-long engagement, which, which was, you know, really tough for us both, I'm sure. Um, I know something is wrong. No, I ain't doing everything perfect, but I'm trying. At this point, now I'm just the the I'm opening up the doors on everything financially. I'm talking about new Range Rover, uh, new this, new that. Then I'm still rubbing feet. I'm still asking how her day was, trying to be emotionally connected. Trips out the country, just whatever, because I'm thinking maybe she doesn't feel uh, invested in, or maybe she don't feel soft life enough. So it would happen for a little bit where we good, and then we would kind of disconnect again. And then baby boy is born. And then now we kind of riding the high of that. So it was a lot of volatile ups and downs, go through the whole year. And now her mom's friend, who claims to be like a prophet, we go and meet with her. And this started the kind of, I call it honestly, a little bit too far, the super religious thing that started happening. Um, and the prophet friend of her mom was like, y'all going to have a lot to go through and y'all going this, that and the other. And then she started speaking and I ain't like that. And we kind of clashed about that because it's connected to our mom. Um, but this is the first year of the marriage where it's like, man, now we're really, really falling apart. She said y'all going to go through a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, it's almost like the Zodiacs. They'd be like, yeah, today you're going to blink. 
Like this, yeah, it's life. We're gonna go through life. You know you what say I'm saying? Today we're gonna blink. <laughs> I just was weirded out by the whole I didn't understand at that time prophecy, and I believe in it now. I've met totally legitimate. So when you look back on it, was she right or wrong? Yeah, she was that about that. <laughs> yeah, she was absolutely right. We went through all kind of stuff, absolutely. Um, but for me, it was just a weird dynamic to introduce. Early on in your marriage, like yeah, you yeah. setting up for doom at the and, beginning. And then it started the whole what God told me and God said, and I'm like, you my wife, not my pastor. Oh, she started saying that to you yes. from that relationship. Yes. And then they formed a little four-person church, which I had a different name for it at the time. What name um, you call it? Cult. A cult. So, so she was going to this four-person church. Now she began to prophesy over you. What, what prophecy? It didn't get super heavy on that until um, 2019, the actual prophesying and reading prayers off a piece of paper and stuff like that. Um, but it was 2018. This is when I got the haircut by the girl that um, I used to deal with whenever we were single. Now, me, I'm thinking it's okay, and I hope she don't feel no kind of way about me saying this, but we got to be real. At this point, I honestly thought she had trans, uh, transformed, like transgendered over. She wasn't as the same person, okay? Like, like definitely homeboy. Looking I'm at the her, one to cut your hair. The one to cut my hair. Okay, all right. So when I couldn't get you know people to cut my hair, da, 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 and this became a big deal. This was like one of the major fallouts before we really started to just plummet. Um, the girl that posted me, I was at her barbershop, but she posted me and put hearts on it or something like that. But at this point, <sighs> hope she don't get offended. She looked like a boy. And I, I saw that she looked like a boy. I'm like, oh, it's all good now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People, this is a new age. She a man. She living her truth, his truth, what, what have you. Um, nope. Danae found out about it by seeing that story. Called, I mean, Danae is one of them passionate people both ways. And it's a beauty when it's a beauty. But she also knows how to hit you where it hurts. What to say to you, how to say it. Um, so she said some stuff, man. And at this point, I'm like, I've, I'm tapped. Now what I'm really she tapped. Saw, she, what, she's, did she call you gay? No, she, she didn't the, call. No, she didn't call me. Gay. I thought you said that because of the, the picture, of the the girl. The, she looked like a, a street hooper or something like that, man. She just looked like a like. I mean, I'm not trying to be messed up. She I know, like but a, I'm saying I'm thinking it's cool. But what she, did, what did Naya say that was like hitting below the belt? Um, she's still calling me an f boy. She's still saying I'm a cheater. And at this point, I'm not cheating. And and so again, it's not good enough to do stuff intermittently because ultimately, even whenever you look like you're doing something, yeah, you, you're you making look. your person relive the same trauma all over again. Um, me. At that point, I was so heavy into defensiveness. So the moment she called me something, instead of like sitting with that and saying like, what makes you feel like, have you been, like all the stuff that we probably know to do now, at that point, I'm just defending myself. Like, man, I can't do nothing right. All you do is mention what I don't do or what I do wrong and what it looks like I'm doing wrong. But I done did it and I listened to all this stuff I've been doing and it ain't nothing. Yep. So it started that clash because she feeling unheard, I'm feeling unheard. Um, and this is at toward the end of the marriage. And this actually preceded it didn't cause it preceded the first time that i stepped out in the marriage caregiver coach pat bailey how are you doing today you know what latera's i'm really not doing as well as i could today why not because 50 percent of our families are experiencing some sort of emotional disconnect 50 percent. wow that's the same statistics for divorce you know what makes it so sad when it comes to our parents ephesians 6 and 2 tells us we need to do better than this so how can we do better well, the first thing we need to understand is you're going to be a caregiver or you're going to be cared for. And in particular, with the statistics associated with Alzheimer's, 6.5 million people today with Alzheimer's. By 2050, we're talking about 18 million people. Oh, you're talking about three times as many. Three times as many. But there's a process that we need to engage in today. You got to tell me how. I want everyone to understand and embrace a four-phase process. Okay. First thing, I recognize we're going to have some deniability about the fact that we're aging. But we are. You need to accept your responsibility associated with it. You actually need to now become a, a, a discovery agent, researcher on what do I need to do? And then you need to manage that process. OK, so please, caregiver coach Pat Bailey, tell us how do we manage that process? Well, first thing you need to do is you need to connect with me. OK. Yeah, connect with me on social media. And what's your social media handles? At Caregiver Coach Pat Bailey. I know you got to have a website. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what, findingnewtomorrows.com will send you a free resource guide. Listen, I thoroughly appreciate all that you said today, and we got to change those statistics. Today. Today. And that was what, year one? That was right at the end of year one. It was after a year of engagement with none of that. And then at the end of the year one of the marriage. And did she ever find out about that? Um, when I confessed it to her. Oh, you confessed it? How, yeah. how long after? 
this was when we separated up in 2020. So this was a little, maybe a year and some change after. Is that when she, when she left in 2020 and went back home to her mom? So yeah, we had, um, I told her I wanted to separate. Like, so I was saying that year just off and on. It might be four or five months I'll go without doing nothing. And then we still clashing at this point. I'm in the condo. I think y'all talked about that a little yeah. bit. Um, so you had two residents. You you as again you balling out of control. You had this big old mansion, and then you had this condo in downtown Atlanta, right? Yeah, we always had plans of having multiple homes. So um, at first it was I'm uh, the, my warehouse, but it was too busy over there. Then I got like Airbnb. It was like a thousand dollars a night. So we talked about having a condo, and then what would it, what it would look like for her to be okay with that? Clearly, it's probably not going to be. No. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and understandably. But the, the thing we came up with was that she was going to have a key fob so she can get in whenever she want, unannounced. Um, and when we had a babysitter, we'll go down there. But that's going to be our first time having a second residence, whatever. So as time went on, when we clashed, though, I started staying at the condo more. Because I was already like, again, we working a plan. Mm-hmm. I'm going to grind. I'm setting this, this, and up. It's going to be residual by this year. And so... Um, it was like maybe like three or four months of coming home when we so disconnected, she would either be asleep by the time I got there or in the time that I was in the shower, she would jump in the bed and go to sleep. She was just, again, this was her way of soothing or whatever, yeah. but she didn't really talk and I'm sitting asking whatever. So I'm coming home to a reject. I just stopped coming. Now I wasn't immediately going to go cheat, but I'm like, you know, I, I would just rather stay at the, at the condo if I, instead of coming home and being reminded that I'm despicable. Um, and that lasted about, I would say about seven, eight months before I started back tripping out, before I started back, you know, stepping out and stuff. So what you did, you said, so the first time towards the end of the, uh, about December of the first year, and then you would cheat, then you come back, confess, and then- uh, No, 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 I didn't confess. So that time- You confessed I, towards the, when y'all were After we really fell out, so- In 2020. We, yeah, so in that time, in 2019, mid-2019, so I started tripping out, I'm like, this is definitely over. I can't do this. Um, but I remember feeling like one thing they don't really- First of all, y'all got married what year? 2019? Beginning of 2018. Y'all got married beginning of 2018. January 13th. So that means the end of 2018, that's when you cheated. Yeah, for then, the first time. And then and then 2019 came around. 2019, um, it's like, oh, get back on track. Just, you know, bygones, bygones. Forget about it. Never happened. And then um, it was about seven, eight months in where we still was having the same type of clashes. And even though I wasn't doing anything, it's like it's it's like man, I don't I can't be around her. I can't, you know, I need my peace. You know, but it wasn't I, the same. Was it the same woman that you would go back to, or you, you no, went back to your old ways? Because I didn't want basically old ways. So yeah. my whole thing, and and you know, it's crazy. You looking about to say back if you had it, sex with the same person over and over again, it's going to build up something. It's going to build up something. So you want to make it where it's we, multiple people, so it's not so. Meaningful. Which is it's wild even thinking about the justifications and exceptions. Like, well, this ain't so bad because I ain't letting them fall in love. It's not a relationship. It's just something physical or whatever. Um, but that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, that's real. That's exactly what I was like. And man, don't don't let it go too far with one. And then you had to mix that. Like, I ain't saying you got to, but I was mixing that in with, all right, man, stop. Just like, all right, I got it off. I got that off my, out my system. Let's start back get back, clean. get back in. Get back in. And then we'll go a good couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, and we clash again. What's interesting is that y'all never completed the counseling sessions that y'all have for premarital counseling, and those same issues then do nothing but follow you into the marriage. Absolutely. And, and so now we see that the clash of the titans take place in 2020, where she said that she left, mm-hmm. and she left, and no notice. You you basically come home, your family gone, something like that. So what happened was I was like, enough of this cheating stuff. I'm done again. This time I'm going back in. If it don't work, it don't work. This was in like end of December of 2019, actually. I think the, the, maybe the first, the January 1st, 2nd, something like that. And I burnt every bridge, every bridge that I had. What is looking like burning bridges? What is burning, burning bridges is like, I don't want to continue this any further. I mean, do um, you say that to the women? Yes. So you have a conversation and say- I'd send a text. I was sending a text. All right, you'll send a text. Yeah. Hey, I ain't finna, be, I ain't finna mess around with you no more. It's I don't done. want to mislead I'll, you. I don't see this going any further. Um, we're done. Don't expect to hear from me. That kind of thing. And I'm, and I'm tapping back into my wife? Or do you say- I wouldn't I, even say that. I think uh, at that time for those messages, I just was saying like, we're done. But they knew what it was. They knew I was on the outs. We were estranged. We were in different pl- all these things. Yeah. Um, so none of them really gave me too much flack about it at that time. But for me, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm dipping in out of giving myself excuses. So sometimes I do, and sometimes I feel guilty. I feel like the hypocrite I was being. I feel like, man, I'm leading people. I'm, I'm preaching and I'm, I'm counseling, whatever. But I'm not living it. Right. And uh, so I would, you know, the resentment had me feeling like, well, 
In this situation, it's different because I feel like this. I done rolled out the red carpet. I done been everything she asked me to be and more. And it's been spat on. That's just resentment talking and having you thinking that, oh, it's cool because. Yeah, but then, justified. But then that truth really hits you at some point when you're talking about it and somebody say something like, I'm glad there are men like you in the world. And then that, that, that no, conviction like, hit. Honestly, bro, I ain't, I ain't even that kind of man in the world. How did it feel? She said one day she called you out, and this was early on before y'all got married. She said, do you even believe the stuff that you say? Yeah, this was back in North Carolina. Right. Um, I felt like, I understood what she was saying, but I was like, why is this the first time you referencing my career? Because, okay, I didn't just talk about don't cheat. A lot of my stuff was about, you know, leave thoughtful gifts, write poems, write love letters, let her know how you feel, da 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 da, -da all these different efforts, sacrifice, um, breakfast in bed. These are things I all did. And I was like, why is it that that stuff is obsolete? And the only thing that exists to you is the, the, the time I've now come up short. That's when you ask me about this stuff. Yeah, and it's interesting because, of course, that is an eraser. If I gave you a car, gave you um, Birkin bags, if yeah. I bought you Chanel shoes and all this type of stuff, don't but matter. I can't be faithful. She's like, like I don't give a what? damn. You keep all this nonsense. Right, I right. want you to, what you what, what's free is fidelity. Yeah. Give me that. Absolutely. And at that time, I, again, I'm not thinking like that. Of course. You, you, I'm measuring myself not just by I eventually was unfaithful. I'm measuring myself by the times that I went to sleep with her in that bed knowing I wasn't going to get none. And she turned it over for three months. Yeah. So I'm looking at it now understanding. Of but course. exactly what you said, sometimes the good ain't worth it, you know, depending on what bad it is. When did she, and we go back to that, when did she actually tell you that, hey, I had been through this sexual assault um, early on, a couple of weeks before we met. This was in Greenville. So I didn't get the full scope for years. I didn't know the timeline. She had just told me first, she told me, okay, it was this person and it was before you that I got uh, raped or what have you. And that was in North Carolina. So I had to be like five, six years in. So that was the first time she's I kind of, She said she just kind of just said it real quick and just went on about business. Well, it was kind of like in the middle of some type of conversation, some things we hadn't told each other, she revealed that. And I was like, I don't even know how to handle that. Right. We, I don't think either of us knew just how much it affected her. Of course. Um, or our, you know, our sexual relationship. Because every time, I think anyway, that we was having sex, I think it kind of re-traumatized her. Yep. Because especially, you know, not to get graphic, yep. the type of, you know, affection I show and the way I, way I move in that, that bedroom. And then on top of that, the porn saying, you know, yep. this is intimacy. Yep. So um, I didn't know what she was going through in sex, after sex with me. And because of what she had gone through before, and it was always expressing in different ways. But I mean, it was me trying to piece it together like, oh, this is why I get the type of anger and rage that probably was meant for such and such, yep. but is now coming towards me. That's real. When did she reveal like the next layer of it? You said she'd give you a piece here. And then when did it finally hit you like, wow, this is this is connecting the dots of all this? So after our... Um, Sep the separation in February of 2020, when I yeah, woke up and the family was gone, I had been asking about seeing the kids and how could we work that out, and she, she boom, she jetted. Um, we went up and down of whether or not we was going to make the marriage work, or we was going to try to anyway. And so one of those efforts <clears throat> later on was with a um, trauma recovery specialist or something like that. I think she mentioned her before, Dr. Yeah, Smith. She, yeah, she said she had all kind of counselors and therapists. Yeah, and we went through quite a few, but that was whenever she dealt, because she knew how, to, she had the competence to really deal with that. Right. And it was, again, permeating. So, you know, of course, what's gotten sensationalized is my part and all the things that I did, but we were dealing with the twofold issues before there was any infidelity, and part of it was how she showed up in conflict. Um, that's when we went in deep, and then the therapist was steady, helping me become an ally to her, because I was like, I don't want to traumatize her. Like, there's still a woman I love. I want to make it work and stuff, but I, how do I help her if I can help her heal? And it meant, like, certain exercises to get her comfortable with my touch, knowing that I was safe, I was different. So that was it, man. I was saying about the summer, I mean, maybe, like, May of 2020. Yeah. To put it all together, it was a couple of months into the separation. And so when y'all were separated, y'all were still working towards helping the relationship. Here and there. So, you know, any little argument or whatever could cause her to ghost um, there was a couple of times I just, you know, I, I honestly thought it was over a few times, mm -hmm. but I would try to keep in contact with the kids and she may ghost me for a week or two and I can't talk to nobody. Um, yeah, but most of that we were up until I would say about June, May or June. And then that was whenever it was like, we're getting divorced lawyers. She's basically letting me know it's over with. I don't care what you do. And yeah. During that time when she left, 
uh, did you find that as an opportunity to say, okay, she gone. I don't know what happened to this marriage anyway. Were you like, finna wild out again? I'm single now. Um, the only time, when I started wilding out was when my birthday came in July. Before that, I was just flying up there. I probably so you, you So you tell me during that time, she's gone. Now you want to be faithful? Right. So, I mean, right. No, exactly. Now, now that she's gone, now I want to prove myself. But the thing was, again, I gave my life to Christ in February. You right. And I was trying my best to uh, walk this straight line. This was before she left, <clears throat> before she knew anything. I was in my truck and I had a conversation with a guy. Like, I got away from you. I, you know, earlier in my years, I was with you. And now look at how things have turned out. So now I'm walking a separate walk from her. Um, we walk in this thing for marriage, but I'm personally trying to be aligned. You know, I don't right. clearly I, I'm not good at this, whatever, whatever. So um, in this time, I'm just whatever it takes to close the gap. If if she's not wanting to talk to me this week or what have you, let me be with the kids because they were begging for me, especially Marley. I would hear Marley crying for me and she would ask me when I'm going to see you again. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we all at the mercy of your mama's. I ain't say this, yeah. but I was like thinking to myself, we all at the mercy of your mama's anger with me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to soothe her. I was just trying to be close. That's what I was the whole summer. And if everybody else on pandemic, I'm flying. I probably spent like twenty, thirty thousand dollars just in that time between flights, Airbnbs and everything else. She wouldn't let you come stay with. The, well, no, nah, she was with her mom. Her she mom wouldn't even tell me which in her mom. She told me her mama told her not to let, not to, not to talk to you, not to. Her mama was so heavily involved um, in our marriage, in our restoration. The counselors, the pastors, all said, "Y'all can't make this work if she's involved." Yeah, she was in the counseling session with her, like marriage counseling session with her. And you I understand. Y'all, yes. When really? we came back, well, one, she was in the session beforehand. She was in because Danae would have personal sessions with the therapist. Um, and then we got back joint with the same therapist. She said, why is your mother in the same room as your counseling? Do you not have a boundary with your mother? Why is she in there? Um, that was the first time. And then after that, we had, when we was going to reconcile, we came together with our pastor because we had the same pastor and we sat down. Her mom came and sat in on our family restoration session or what have you. I understand to a degree though, because she's seen her daughter go through so much. Any parent, I'm sure myself, it would be like, nah, whatever it takes. I don't care what rules I'm breaking. Don't tell me no Bible verses. I'm here to make sure my baby is good. Um, but she was as much as part of the, of the marriage as me and Danae were, probably even more. Well, you said if she's sitting in the council, said, I've never seen that before. So yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah it was kind of crazy. Um, was there any type of abuse that would allow her to want to step? Sit Not there? abuse, man. No physical abuse. Um, you know, if you consider cheating abuse, and yeah, um, especially emotional, it definitely caused trauma. But nothing where she was like in danger. Her and her mom, this is just my belief, have a, a weird relationship. It's more like girlfriends because they're only like 15 years apart, 16 years apart. Um, but her mother from day one didn't like me. And I think whenever I hurt the it's like, oh, see, I was right. Yeah, yeah, confirmation. And so that's an all access pass to stay in the relationship no matter what. Um, my belief was I've done my wrong, but we as adults, we're 30 something years old, we're not children. And we have um, professionals that are involved. Right. We have godly counsel that's involved. And we've both professed our lives to be, you know, Jesus. Like, you yeah. know, we, we Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So this is a, we're going by this construct now. Um, it's time for mom to get some healthy separation. Which is leaving and cleaving. Leaving and cleaving. So love on, you know, I'm talking to Danea because honestly, she's the gatekeeper. Um, but to that point, yes, she was with her mom. Her mom would often speak over her while we were on the phone. Um, all kinds of stuff. And, then, you know, that's one of those things that I still got to work on my heart. Cause yeah, because I, I, I can say, I, when I mentioned that, your whole, <laughs> I said, is he finna cry or is he finna get mad? <laughs> well, I try, man, look, I'm not trying to stir up nothing because, again, I get her mother's MO. Participation, the reason why. I get it, it, was, it, was, it was to be protective. Protective, but then you know, sometimes and then you I cross. was right, you know, and that's the kind of thing that's going on. But um, to your point, the entire time we were trying to restore all the way from February, March. Now we done flew over to churches. We done. There's a lot that's yeah, going she said, on. She said that she gave you some, 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 some a, a homework assignment. She was like, "I want to see you get stronger with, 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 you know, build your relationship with God. Get some accountability around you. Um, um, be more present in your kids' life because you got you so you know, like most men, they get to working and doing all this type of stuff. That she said she wants you to be more intentional on spending time with your kids. And I think there's one other thing. Are those true? 
those those three things. Two or three. three. It wasn't to spend time with the kids, um, and then we kind of had a little back and forth about that because I love spending time with the kids. Um, if you if they're ever around us, you'll see they gravitate towards me because I'm pre- I love my kids, and that was the whole plan is to get back to where we can both be in. But yes, for a time, I'm gonna be away from the house yeah. most of the day. So I had about a, a <clears throat> an hour or two per day of quality time that I could do, and on the weekends a little bit more. But what she was, what I understood, what she was saying, because I don't want to speak for. Her, was her saying, I want you to do some of the things with the kids, like wake them up, get them to school, oh, okay. pick the them daily, up. The daily task. And we we had a little bit of a beef about that because I'm like, hold on. You, 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 you work from home. I mean, I guess she was working, but she was a stay-at-home wife, but then she would help you on some back-end stuff. You saying, that's your role. You got the time for it. Let me go hunt. It was a, it was a plan. Yeah. And, and the plan wasn't just that she'd be at, because that's a hard job. Yeah. You know, two young kids, two under two. Um, but I had already invested in a private school, twenty five hundred a month. So eight hours a day, five days a week. She for, some to, two, for some two year olds. Two, two. Uh, at this point, I think one was just turned just turned three. Mom just turned three, and DJ was one and a half, going on two. You had some little kids in private school. In private school, it was a little goddess school down there because it was too young for pre K. So it was a daycare, but it was a private school. They had a curriculum and everything else. So they would go there Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, eight hours a day. What eight is, hours so a day. What was Danae doing then? So this was our conversation where we clashed on um, exactly what all she was doing because then we had babysitters. So she had raised some of these issues like, hey, the house is too big to clean. Um, you know, I'm really exhausted with the kids every day. So I already had said, OK, I understand. all I need you to do is tell me. So I made the investment for private school, for the sitter, um, for the cleaning service to come twice a, twice a week. And whenever she had these demands, I'm like, look, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get back in your good graces, whatever. But I also want to be reasonable. If I'm working, paying every bill, you don't have to touch anything or whatever. And that includes the fun stuff and investing in the soft life thing. What are you going to be doing? That's what I asked. Because by this time, she's not working with the company anymore. Actually, she wasn't working anymore. She had been said, I want to do my own thing. So I was like, whatever you want to do, I'll invest in. I want to support you. So I'm like, you're not working in the business. So you're, what did she do? She had a, a clothing shop or something? Nothing at all at this point. Um, she had talked about real estate and I paid for whatever it took for that, but she didn't really pursue it. Um, I think at this point, she actually started doing the travel thing with her mom. And so, you know, I, I helped what I could with that. But what travel thing is a travel agency? She had a travel agency okay. with her mom. Her, her mom and her had a, their own business, what have you. Um, so yeah, that was our clash. And I'm like, I don't think this is helpful and I don't think this is sustainable because I'm not with this. I'm going to pay for everything and da-da-da-da, but then still get up in the morning, get the kids or whatever. I want to spend time with my children, but not take on responsibilities because at the end of the day, we still got work to do. So I forget where we was at with it, but that no, was what we had. Right her, her list of homework included some things that we didn't necessarily agree on, but I didn't need her to tell me to get closer. to. I was trying to pursue God at this point for myself. Um, and I think it helped that she saw a lot of that initiative on my own because one of the pastors that she watches on TV and then I ended up popping she, up. That's with what him. she said. She said she was watching YouTube or watching something. You popped up down there at the, at the altar uh, in the in the service or something. Yeah, I didn't leave him alone um, because she said di- you just start. You was like, I'm going to start following this minister around. That's what you start doing Something to that degree. We developed a rapport. Um, so she didn't mention I, I didn't watch the whole thing, by the way, so I yeah. could be could, could be wrong, but. There was a space before we separated where she got really infatuated with demons. And she didn't just say, I need a deliverance either. She said, the Lord God is taking over my vessel. You're going to die, go broke, and all these other things. She said, you are? Yes. Now, later on, she said, well, I was speaking to the demonic spirit. And you? Yes. And this is an interesting dynamic for anybody with their spouse to talk about you speaking to. So anyway, um, I started looking into it and I realized, oh no, demonic influence is very real. Right. But I don't know nothing about it. I grew up in a very traditional church. We ain't talk too much about that. You know, we understand we don't flesh uh, war against flesh, but of course the spirit and all this stuff. But this goes a different level, like demon spirits, the name of this demon, so on. And there was one pastor, she introduced me to him that knew about this stuff. So I went and found him. And we also had some stuff where she wouldn't let me see the kids because um, my demons is making them. And I'm like, so why is it everybody else got demons but you? And I would have these conversations like, why everybody else influenced but you? And then we had this fight now where I felt like she asserted herself as my spiritual authority or her, my superior. She's so pure and angelic and God's first cousin. But then me, I'm just Lucifer's baby boy. Um, me, I'm getting clarity from this pastor because now I've watched enough of his stuff or whatever. You trust Met him. And he took to me. And he was able to tell me some stuff that validated that he was indeed a man of God and whatever. And he took to me and was like, I could see your heart or what have you. And I was like, look, I want to serve you any way I can. 
I want to be a part of the ministry or what have you. So that's what started. When I, I didn't just follow him. We was talking. He was kind of mentoring me. He became my spiritual father. And so um, did anybody else confirm? Was there some deliverance service where maybe that passed in a couple of other apostles or something linked around you and cast the demon out of you? Um they they cast like I did go up there to the front and I got the deliverance and all that stuff, but it wasn't like necessarily what she was saying. It was um, when we all discussed it together because now he's a friend of the marriage. He wants to help us, and when he was like, you know, Danelle, you may be seeing some stuff like a spiritual wife, spirit wife, or something like that. Right. He's like, that's absolutely true because he's out here smashing and dashing or whatever. Right. Um, but some stuff you're getting, you have to be brought up and taught how to interpret it. So Danelle was actually, I, I think anyway, very well meaning. Um, because she wanted to protect her family. At one point in time, she was trying to protect me, praying over me. Um, before we separated, I had woke up one day and she had her hand on me and she was praying over me. So it was like sometimes it came from this pompous place of, you know, uh, throwing the book at me and judgmental and so on. But at times it came from a very nurturing and protective place. So he, he confirmed we both needed deliverance. Um, and even because of her mom's involvement, that she needed deliverance right along with us in order for everything to come back together. And so what happened to where now, what, what transpired for her to move back from, where was she in Denver? Where, where was the family She from? was living in Denver. Mm -hmm. And what made her transition and say, okay, let's, you know, uh, reconnect with my husband and let's try to make this work and move back to Atlanta. So that pastor had, um, this was after my birthday and um, I've been wilding out and stuck. I'm like, it's over with. Honestly, I felt so empty, man. And I cut everything off before I even knew if I would have a chance with her. But at this point, I had started rebelling against God because I'm like, God, July. this was in July. February 4th, I gave my life to Christ in the truck. And um, it's like, all right, tomorrow. I'm, I, I was, it was for different reasons. I didn't want to go back home before that. But I was like, tomorrow I'm coming back home and uh, we're going to make this work. We're going to thug this out the, the, the God way. Yeah. And that's whenever I came back to she was gone. I was like, the day after I gave my life to Christ, things started going here. And I blamed him. Mm -hmm. I went through some rebellion all over again, man. Screw this. F it. So anyway, that was the end of July. I was like empty. I'm like, man, I done rented out yachts and I done did all this money spending and these, these you know, random girls I'm kicking it with. Um, I don't even know them or like them. So uh, just being real, like I don't even like you. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, man, go on somewhere, man. And uh, you know, before she before she said anything, I again burnt the bridges. I'm so off and on. But August comes around, I think it was August, and my spiritual father's gonna have another event. I had stopped kind of being around him for a little bit while I was in that stage. But I was like, I need to go over there. So that stage was just the month of July? I would say June into July. Okay. Yeah. So February, she, she leaves February, right? February, you give your life to Christ. The next day she leaves, you start trying to get your feet in Christ. Uh, you start, you find that once you connect with the spirit. I went lead. head first into it, man. I made friends with pastors. I reached Willie Moore Jr. I was yeah. reached out to him as a man of God. And I was like, man, what group are you a part of where y'all stay on the straight and narrow? Yeah. And they didn't know anything about any of this. Yeah. I was pursuing this. I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up again, you know. So anyway, um, what was the question again? So you started working towards that. And working then, towards and then that. July, and then she's, July, you said what? Because we were talk, we were discussing my birthday. And she was like, I'm not seeing you for your birthday. And I was like, you know, you know, mm -hmm. abandonment still hurt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't healed nothing to do with abandonment wound at this point. Um, so I was like, my birthday? I was like, can I at least see my babies? You know what I'm saying? Can I do that? Well, I'm taking them to a church event. I was so beside myself. Um so anyway, we definitely knew the relationship is over. She getting, we got a child custody agreement in place, all this stuff. Um, I had my rendezvous. Then after that, cut everything off. My spiritual father going to have an event. She happened to be at the event. Oh, really? This was actually down here in Dallas. He was going to have it at the Marriott. He's going to have like a, a three-day event or something like that. Um, I had, I was like, I, wanna, I want another chance with my family, but I don't know. You know, it's just too much. But I brought a picture to put it on the altar and pray on everything else. Her mama came with her. And brought the kids. And we had not at this point talked in like two weeks. So it was the first time you've seen your wife at church with your kids? In a minute. Yeah. No, we had seen each other throughout the summer, but this time. No, I'm talking about, you said for two weeks. There was a couple of weeks. I had actually, I had, we had discussed me seeing the children because I kept trying to just keep some closeness with them. Um, I went up to Denver to see them. And from that point, she ghosted me. She stopped answering. So I was up in Denver for like five or six days. Um, she wouldn't answer or what, nothing like that. And like a week and a half later, we was at the church at the same time. And you looking up like, wow, there go my wife and kids. I broke down um, really seeing the kids because I was like, at this point, I'm wanting another chance, but I'm also understanding. 
And she's kind of beat me up at this point. So I'm like, whatever on that to a degree, but I really, really miss my babies. So they ran into my knees and I'm like, man, like maybe. And so he had the sermon afterwards. He, all he offered to see families that were trying to restore. And that's whenever we had the session, her mom came in and sat right down with her um, as we had our family session. And at some point the pastor said, why is mom here? And then, so they had came visit. You, you weren't living in a DFW metro place at this time. No, 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 no. N neither one of us were. But basically, that was the point where we said we're going to try again. That's okay, whenever, and, that, and that's that, in that conversation. Did her mom co-sign on that at that time? Um, she just kept listening and nodding along and stuff like that. So I don't know. I don't know the conversation with her mom, but I guess she did. I don't know. And then y'all decide to let's do it again. Let's do it and again. And decide to what? Move to Dallas? The first month is I'm going to spend up there because she wasn't ready to part from her mom yet. So I, moved, I got another Airbnb for 30 days. Dang. And then we moved down to Dallas um, together. Um, and we moved to another Airbnb while we found a place. And we, uh, we started the restoration. And this is where, honestly, bro, the whole thing, this was like one of the most beautiful things that was happening. I could tell some distance happened with her and her mom because I could always tell whenever she was close. She would come, man, I'm talking about, she get a call, come back, and she hates me. Now it's some distance. Now we're starting to reconcile. Now we're talking. We're still going through with the therapy. We crying, we expressing, we forgiving on both ends. Because everybody know about my sins, but it was some stuff she, you know what I'm saying? So uh, the kids are seeing it, you know, and this is when I started, I wrote a book, Healed Together Without Hurting Each Other, but I wrote it based on all the things we were doing. We had a schedule now. So we went through that process. This is toward the end of 2020, I think. Things ain't perfect, but we, we fighting for it. We in church together. We serving in church together. Um, we praying um, most of the time together. We doing warfare, all of it. And then comes 2021. What happened in 2021? March of 2021. I think it was the 22nd or 23rd. No, no, no. Actually, a little bit before that, a month prior, my auntie passed. Um, it was my mama's only sister. And that was really tough for me because she was always the one that was most proud of me outside of my mom. And two weeks later, my dad passed, my stepdad passed. And so we went to, um, at this point, man, I don't take losses well, you know, deaths are nothing. So I'm messed up. And um, as we were preparing to go there, maybe a, in a week prior, we found out we were pregnant with our third baby. We couldn't even enjoy that because it's so much comp compounding right. grief. And she's just like, I got you. I'm here for you, et cetera. So we go to my dad's wake. Um, and like that evening, there's a girl from the separation time, my birthday time, that's doing an interview. And I'm like, I ain't got time for this. I'm just like, man, I ain't got time for this. I done got beat up fighting for this family. I done got beat up in grief. I done got, you know, the financial piece because I, I had to work to eat. So I'm, I kept payroll. And I never kept making money because at this point, I'm just all family, all Christian walk. So now my finances are starting to look a little funny. Um, and then this. So that night, we kind of put it away. My, my dad's funeral, my phone is blowing up. I had to put on airplane mode, all this stuff. And I'm like, I got to face them. Um, I got to face them. They, Who was the them? Them being the people that supported me, the public. Because, you know, of course, I didn't talked about this and da 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 da. And here it is. I, I knew at some point I would talk about it. But I didn't plan to talk about it until our family was stronger. You know? I, I would say that 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 that's pretty darn impressive that out of all the dirt you did, it took that long for somebody to say something. Yeah, I think it has something to do with this may have been the first time I cut people off the way she wanted me to cut them off as opposed to really friendly. And oh, that's what she also said. Out. She said, cut them off and then get a new phone. That was the other Not thing. only, yeah, it was get a new phone, get a new place, throw out, you know, a yeah, whole lot of stuff. Move to city, yeah. You know, $60,000, $70,000 worth of furniture, sculptures, paintings, clothes, You talking everything. about do what? Get rid of it? Throw it away. I wish I knew you. Don't sell it. Don't give it away. Gosh, I wish I knew you. But. What are you talking about? You just throw it away. I know you gave it to some people. It was one of two things I gave away. Because um, when my family found out I was going to throw away all this expensive stuff and sculptures and stuff, they was like, no, we're coming up there. <laughs> Um, but yeah. most of it, no, I literally had to show her I was cutting through my custom oh, paintings. Oh, because she's talking about the spiritual stuff. She had been hitting me with all of that stuff, but I was And you like, really told that stuff up? I did. You talked about your clothes and everything. It was a show of good faith, because even though I didn't agree with her, but I was like, you've seen enough actions of me trying to do it my way, and it ended us up in this situation. Last thing I'm going to do is still assert myself as the authority on how this needs to make you comfortable. So if she's saying it's triggering her... I was like, I'll give it up. It's so your me. family came and got, got something? Some of my family came up there. It was like, nope, we taking this, we taking that. Um, 
this was actually, excuse me, the separation. So she wasn't there. And they was like, nope. They found out through all this stuff, TVs and everything. Man, so we fast forward to 2020, like again, compounded grief. And then I'm like, I want to face them. At first, she was really, you know, really pissed, but supportive still. She was like, you know, we knew this was going to come. I'm 10 toes. You know what I'm saying? I got you, da, da, da. And then we come So hold on. So I get that. You really want your marriage to work then, huh? Man. I never would think that. And that's why I said you got to wait. Can't pass judgment on people. I literally assumed that you were stuck in a marriage. You were getting along just to get along. But your heart was really wanting to be in these streets and smash all these women. No. You're saying that. What I'm getting from you, you ain't even saying this, but what I'm getting from you is that, no, I really want the marriage to work. It just so happened that I was doing this stuff behind the scenes when I felt neglected and felt this type of stuff. It was you really want to be married. Absolutely. I wanted my family. Um, I wanted to be married, but I wanted us to stay cohesive. That was the biggest thing on my mind. Stay in so, the so house. So answer this real quick. So be married or want your family? Meaning, would it be okay to have this this perfect hybrid of a relationship. Hey, Danea, I have a propensity to smash chicks on the side. Can you be okay with that? I'm going to give you this soft life, give you this wonderful life you live in. I love my family. I'm going to be here for my kids. Hey, I, I love them. I got three kids now. This is amazing. But just let me go out here and smash some people from time to time. Would that she, be the perfect world for you? No, that'd be hell. Why? Wow. Because um, it was hell when I was doing it behind her back. I wasn't happy. I was coping. Um, she actually offered up for me to be with other women. And I think this may have been after she saw something on my phone but hadn't told me, but she said, you know, what if I just allow you to have other women? And I was like, I thought it was an opportunity to talk. I'm like, no, I don't want other women. I want things to work between us. And even as I'm looking back at it, really, bro, that sh it still shouldn't have come to that because I was reacting. You know, she don't, we not doing good or whatever. Instead of being accountable to the principles of the marriage, my vows, I was accountable to how I felt. And that was, again, a part of this long pattern of I'll be good so long as I feel good about you and how we doing. But the moment I don't feel good, screw it. So you tell me a perfect situation for you going, getting remarried again is a woman that says, I believe a man, because I've had women come to me before. Women have come to me over the last couple of years. And when I've spoken uh, about infidelity in the past, I have women come to me and be like, because it's not normal for a man to be faithful. So let me tell you something, Terrence, if you choose me as your wife, you can go smash women on the side. It don't matter. That don't bother me. As long as you taking care of the household, as long as you don't let that mess come to my doorstep, I'm cool with it. But the reason why I personally can't do that is because I think you're speaking to the, not think, I know you're speaking to the lowest version of me. That because of my faith and my relationship with Christ, I can't operate like that. But then a lot of times men will say, well, look at the men in the Bible or whatever. I understand that. We're not in that time. You know, I know they had multiple wives. They had all this type of stuff. That's when people are, argue uh, polyamory and, and polygamous. But I was like, that's, that's not me. I know, like you're about to say what you touched on, what that did to my soul. It it grieves my soul. So my question to you is, why couldn't you just do that with your next wife if you decide to get married again? Um, the variety of vagina never pulled me. It wasn't like it was more so physical. It was emotional. I was soothing whenever I, I slept around. Um, that I had went basically like this. Okay, so in the times where I was faithful, like I might spend six months here, eight months here, whatever, three months. When I was happy, I curved girls that most guys would do anything to get next to. But it was when I was unhappy for an extended amount of time, I would at least open the door to have conversations and start there. And then it would go all the way there. Um, a perfect world for me, man, because I, I don't mind the same vagina over and over again. When I'm in love, it feel, it feel new to me every single time. <laughs> I was fine physically. And I mean, this is why we stay connected in that way. There wasn't a complaint there. Right. And I want to be respectful to her as a woman because, you know, she's not my person anymore. And I'm, you know, somebody else's wife eventually. But that wasn't my complaint. Um, my complaint was how cold it felt. And, and honestly, I used to say it. I felt more lonely and single than when I was single. I, in the relationship, just that rejection, that was just the way that she coped and did her own thing. But... That was the part I really wanted. In a perfect world, I didn't feel that. Now, in a realistic world, as a man, I should have had better coping strategies as opposed to coping with women or anything that was going to compromise my vows. I should, have, I should have been equipped and prepared more to deal with that or to leave if I was just so unhappy. But how, I didn't take that responsibility. How are you reconciling that being the, the, the voice for 
caring for a woman's heart, but then privately destroying the woman you had at home. Resentment. That was the denial I needed. It was like you would do anything and feel like you you right in doing it if you feel hurt enough, pissed off enough, disrespected or taken for granted enough. These are a lot of the things that I was saying to her, like, man, you taking me for granted and nothing to do with nothing physical or superficial. It was like how much I'm sacrificing for you. Da, 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 da. But one thing I didn't understand, man, is she wasn't experiencing that. She she was it was like it's kind of like when, if you ever been down on yourself, like, man, life is so bad because you got into it with whoever. But then you had to really think like, no, nah, man, my kids is good. My roof is over my head. I got blood in my, I'm, I'm alive. So it's like objectively some things are true, but you're not experiencing it based on right. what you don't focused on. And what I didn't learn to weigh later was that she never experienced all of these things that was on my mind that I was personalizing that she didn't appreciate. So in a perfect world, man, like it's just I, I, one woman. That's what I want. In the last couple of years of the marriage, that's what I stuck to no matter how I felt. And I know she and apparently the world feels differently. Um, so but, you really, so you really, so you saying, right, when you say the last years, well, we'll, we'll get to there. So you get this lady, she does this interview. What did she say in this interview? I didn't watch that interview either. Um, Why would you watch, how could you not watch a video of somebody talking about you and everybody? I was broke down, brother. I was at my limit. I had just lost two very important people in my life. Um, I already had jacked up my family and we were trying to get it back together. I got a baby on the way. The finances is tricky because I can't even work consistently. Um, Danae at that time, like she was still healing a lot. So I had become the primary parent for the two children, the elder children. They went to the gym with me. I did get them up and brush their teeth and put them to bed and all these different things, taught them and resolve conflict. And so there's so much pressure on me just as a man. And then throughout that process, because I was the wrongdoer, all of my feelings were obsolete. And now it was okay. Like, screw how you feel. Yeah. You hurt her. And so I felt, you know, even more invisible. This goes back to the first counseling session we did, feeling invisible, to childhood. It's like, man, I'm repetitively feeling alone. So as we coming back, and I know they did, I'm like, I can't even, I can't think. I can't think straight. We get back, and I know I'm going to face my audience instead of, you know, being further more cowardly than I already had been. Because no matter what, I want to walk according to what I think is the right thing to do. Um, I faced them that night, but I only talked to what I did in the separation. I didn't tell them I had cheated in the marriage as well. So I was like, again, I want to do this. I want to do this again. Um, and I offered for her to have a voice if she wanted to. Part of our counseling was her having a voice. She, she wanted more of a voice. She said, yeah. And then that's when we did the video. In the video, um, how do you feel about how she represented herself in that video? Well, how you, because you remember, you're the face of, of this brand to have her on there where now she's been attacked from the bonnet, which was something very intentional that I was when she came on the podcast. I said, Danea, I said, listen, the last time I understand how triggering these moments are. I said, so I'm going to get a makeup artist. I'm going to get somebody to make sure you look right. I don't want nobody criticizing you on my platform. Why didn't you give her that same level of care to make sure that when she represented herself, she was representing the best light? I didn't look at her and felt like she needed makeup. I didn't feel like that was the missing piece in, in her being presentable or beautiful. Um, I still honestly, bro, I don't look at that video of what she had on and see anything wrong. The only thing I can see now from the outside is her body language. And I knew what that was because of. But people in real life didn't know. Both of us were shattered. Um, I'm a bit more poised probably in front of the camera. And also I'm more functional. Like even when I'm not OK, I look OK. But she was showing it, right? You know, and but for different reasons. She was pregnant at the time. Pregnant. Was, no one knew that she was. No one knew she was pregnant at the Nobody time. Knew she was she pregnant, and she was somewhat grieving because she knew of my stepdad as well. So we're both coming from some really heavy stuff on top of her being pregnant, on top of this being a season of of attempted reconciliation. Um, and so we show up, and that way I didn't really. Again, it didn't stick out to me because this ain't my first time seeing her. Just, you know, again, I think she's beautiful. Um, and I appreciate what you did in making sure that she was protected. But I know afterwards, when we thought about doing some more conversations, I was like, oh, let's get PR. So our body language ain't the same because I don't want them to talk about you. We did a podcast for a little bit and I was like, I don't want them to talk about you. And I started looking at it from their lens. But at the time, man, um, I don't think she was thinking about herself and me, I don't think, I think I was so selfish in my own feelings. I wasn't thinking about her either. What did you, how did you feel 
um, when the video dropped and people kept talking about her bonnet and they kept saying, I see why he cheated on her. I see why. And they started making the quote unquote victim. That's all we knew. We didn't know about what she, what, what she was doing in you in a relationship. So now she's this victim and now they're victim blaming. She's the reason why her man is unhappy. She's the reason why he's unfaithful because look at how she presents herself. Of course, he's going to want one of these baddies that you see on Instagram. How did you feel seeing that? First, I don't even know where to start. Um, I put her in that position. So as much as I was looking at it and not liking this and that, I was like, my decisions. It's another reminder that my decisions put her in this place. Secondly, I think I just felt helpless because typically I'm the one that like stands for people who get crucified wrongly and especially women, but really anybody. I've stand, stood for men too, but they're like, here I'm obsolete because I'm the one that caused it. Thirdly, there is no connection to a woman's looks and a man's integrity. Mm. One way or the other. Um, she can't look good enough to make me a no man faithful. Teach. And she can't look bad enough to make us step out. Teach. Um, so just in terms of what they were saying, I was like, that's that's bullshit. Like the most beautiful by society standards right. women have Still gotten cheated, cheated on. on. Yep. Because it's, it's, it's not about her looks or her makeup. It's about my character. Thank you. And, or lack thereof. So again, it sucked not being able to say that and stand for that. Um, and I was appreciative of those who did because they were doing what I couldn't do. And so it was really like, I mean, the shame that was already there, the guilt and all this other stuff. And then you add in the, the ripple effect of now family is getting involved. Her mother is, I mean, you talking about might as well moved in. It was so much that went on. I just like totally now I'm obsolete and I'm moving myself and I'm fine with that because I need to make sure she's okay to, to healthily carry this baby. Because she's pregnant still. We still got to go to these doctor's appointments. Yep. She still got to keep an appetite. Um, me, I've been in the middle of scrutiny, and I was fine with that. Like, man, talk about me. One, I deserve it. Two, I'm kind of used to it. Um, but I'm used to it on that level, though. Even That's on that level. Because people, people, people love Derrick Jackson. It's a lot of men that didn't like you, mm -hmm. but women love You look at your social media following. I mean, it's, when did you ever have a million people following you? That's a lot of people that even when you, uh, even when the video came out, people still, I would hear people say, I don't care what he did to his wife. I still find value in what he's saying because he helped me through this and he helped me through this and his video helped me get out this toxic relationship. So no matter how much the world crashed down on you by that, you still had, and I still say the overwhelming majority of people or women that still was advocating for you. Um, I feel a little differently, man. I think not only advocating for me, I think they were advocating for what I stood for and that it didn't just wash that away. What I've gotten from them anyway, because I had people that turned on me and I totally yeah. understand. Um, but the people that in, in real life or even online, they were like, that doesn't take away from your truth. But for me, again, I had rumors go viral about me before. People just don't remember because I wasn't as big. But I've seen tens of thousands of people unfollow me before because they thought the nail was white and I didn't date black women. So I already kind of knew. But I also think I just was too numb to that. Now, this is the first time that scrutiny is coming to somebody I love, or somebody close to me because of me. Right. So that was my whole attention went to, this is a new experience for me in that regard, um, that she's not built like that. Right. You know, she ain't used to this and she wasn't supposed to ever have to get used to it. Um, so what was going on in my mind is just the lowest feeling you could probably imagine. Even with trying to tune out social media and everything else, her coworkers, her mama, her whatever had to see her relive this trauma um, and people making talking points because people kind of forget we both human. Yeah. You know, and they could forget I'm human, but I'm like this girl that y'all go from protect black women to ooh, look at her bonnet. That point. And music videos and stuff like I mean, it's so yeah. insensitive. I'm 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 wishing I could say something, but I'm still the cause of it all. So it's guilt, shame, helplessness, fury, anger. Um, some people that I thought were at least somewhat friends making jokes about it. And it gave me a perspective, man, that like on some level, my platform had probably done the same thing. You know, when I talked about people and, you know, especially holding them accountable, I always thought I did it with a level of, 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 of ethics. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to at least be constructive here. But ultimately, I was making a lot of people's wives relive their own trauma. And if anybody's listening, you know, I was wrong for that. I want whoever I've ever talked about to understand that that was wrong of me. Um, 
But that gave me a perspective I never had before because I saw, I saw her trying to shut it out, but her phone blowing up. Yeah. You know, friends and stuff is concerned. Is she okay? And understandably, but it was overwhelming. When you look at um, what made you record the video, I know you said some of your followers sent the video to you about analyzing yourself, which I thought that that was when you look at that and you and you hear somebody talking in third person about themselves, they consider that textbook narcissism. Mm-hmm. What in the world would possess you to do a reaction video to yourself? Horrible, horrible <laughs> decision making. Um, I was like, why would you do that? Horrible thought process. So for me, whatever I'm going through, my MO has been to just work through it, get up and go do something. But at that point, I'm the biggest conversation. And I was like, this is not something I stand by. But I was like, how am I going to talk about everybody else, but I don't want to talk about me? <laughs> Dumbest decision. Because out of 800 videos, the one that I do in third person is the one that confirms but I'm you're, a narcissist. You're a textbook narcissist. Textbook narcissist. It's third person. And we all have a PhD in narcissism from Instagram. Yeah, we all got it from Instagram, YouTube. So I was like, well, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> and uh, I took <laughs> and it And then down. on top of that, Derek, at the very end, what do you do? Promote a product. I probably product. did. I, don't even, I probably did. He was like, and I have this book that I had come. I, I said, this N-word. Right, the show must like, well, go I said, on. This N-word just sat there and did, what is wrong with this The dude? most detached, uh, not reading the room <laughs> moment probably in, in my life. Mm-hmm. And so when you, so what kind of pushback did you get from that? Um, just the same. It was for me, and again, it's not trying to be arrogant. It's just like for whatever's coming my way, mm-hmm. I know how to, for the most part, block it out. You know, my whole career has been about, you know, being, being able to ignore naysayers. This time it was legit, though. You know, it was something yeah. I really did. I really disappointed people that believed in me. Um, but regardless, so much was going on in my life. I couldn't access how I felt about that. Yeah. And then you're also still processing the loss of your uh, the, the father that you knew. Um, you know, that's your father. Call him stepfather, whatever, but he's been there all the time. That's the only father that I knew. Yep. And, uh, you know, my family's still processing it. My cousin got shot in the head about a month or two after that. It was just, it was like in, in, I was saying about three months, we had four deaths in the family. Uh, my uncle had died while I was at my auntie's funeral. I know it sounds what? like this don't even make no sense. While we was at her funeral, my uncle had died. Now we ain't really like him that much. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I, my mom going, I'm sorry, but I didn't like him that much. So that one was a little less impactful, <laughs> just knowing that you supporting your family who cared about him. Yeah. But the other three were really tough. Um, but it's like, man, I can't be a victim and my children need me. I can't fold. I put everybody in this situation and I wanted to fold. I had a gun on my lap. I wanted to fold. I wanted to be out. You contemplated suicide. I was, I was on my way to pulling that trigger. But Marley came out. Um, they were getting ready to go somewhere. Marley saw my, my tail lights on and said, ooh, daddy's here. Daddy's here. Because um, I was out of the house for a while. And she came and jumped up on the door right at that moment. Are you in a car? Yeah, I was in my truck. I was just doing it in my truck. In the driveway? In the, in the garage or something? No, it was in the driveway. Um, in a little cul-de-sac. So after that, I was you know, kind of scared by how close I got to it. I'm like, I'm not telling nobody because of the shame of I did this and whatever, and I don't have no voice because I'm the bad guy. I'm the mm-hmm. big bad wolf in everybody's eyes now. Um, the resentment in the house is tenfold. Um, I can't stay, say enough about it. But one thing we had talked about was that I don't typically let nobody into my internal struggle, and I needed to do that. So I, I talked to Danae about it. Now, this we're not in a good place here again. And I talked to her about it, and she kind of stonewalled a little bit, just didn't have much to say. But that's when a little bit after that, um, I decided I couldn't do the marriage anymore. This was in 2021, because she was laughing about it with her mom. That she was going to commit suicide? She was laughing about it with her mom. I, I got wind of the conversation. Um, this is after some texts I saw. She was still talking to her mom about the marriage, which wasn't, I mean, like, who can't forgive after all the forgiveness I needed, you know? But this one where I was like, not that she's so bad, you know, in this moment, but it just made it clear how far away from me her heart has turned. Did you divorce her? Did you say you want to divorce by text? Yeah. At that time, we, and any time we tried to talk, especially if it involved her mama, she either ended up yelling or she stonewalled, like blank face until I got done talking and had nothing to say. During the therapy, her, like she witnessed that about her mom yelling at a man, whatever. I never did, but I didn't do well with no yelling. So I knew this was to do with her mom, and I told her, hey, not only do I, I, I can't do this anymore, but this unresolved issue with your mom is a reason why. 
I don't know if she mentioned that or not, um, but a lot of people don't know. It had nothing to do with infidelity as far as why I decided I needed to leave. It was because we had talked about restoring the marriage, but we pastors, counselors, over and over again, be catching that she had talked to her mom or brought her mom into the marriage, and her mama was very intent on staying in the marriage, giving play-by-plays of how to disrespect me, you know, or whatever. Um, at this point, it was like, I already didn't check out. I've been in the guest room over a year. But if we're going to give this a chance, you got to just set the boundary with your mom. You know, I ain't going to put words in your mouth, so I told her, but just let her know you love her and you appreciate her support, but you're committing to this and you need her love to look different. And she kept saying, well, I'll get to it or not yet. No, not ready. And over a year of that, um, I was like, I got to go. And so you sent her a text message. She was up, you was upstairs and she was downstairs on the couch. Yep. And at that point, that was in what year? 2021? This is 2022 now. I so skipped a whole lot, but yeah. 2022 now. 2022, you send that. Um, when you said, hey, I'm about to divorce said woman, uh, what divorce your, your wife, how soon did you start entertaining the woman that we see you boot up with on social media? Boot up. Yeah. Um, Pinky. I What's didn't, her name? Okay. I didn't know Pinky until about two months after. Two months after? Yeah. I didn't entertain anybody until I had filed and moved out. I didn't entertain a single woman. I know people are like, people think that I did because they saw the picture simultaneously exactly. with my announcement when they found to be out. Um, but because again, I'm private, I didn't want to even announce the divorce. I, I didn't see any use in it. I, I'm like, why bring people in at the all it's already been caused. Um, but then when I went down to Miami, I had been moved out now and she had already did the video praying against folks and you know, that kind of thing. Um, I was like, I've been in, so this is me and my experience, not saying she was bad or whatever, but for me, that was a living hell. Being rejected to that degree, being reminded of all the wrong I've done to that degree. Um, over a year in the guest room, um, but even though I did a lot of healing in that time, it was tough to feel so uh, disgusting to a person that you still care about. And so whenever I got out of the house, I was like, I need to be surrounded by friends, family, and love. So other friends and family down there in Miami, but the young lady was going to be there as well. And um, yeah, man, we just enjoyed Art Basel and that's people taking pictures. And honestly, I didn't care because I was like, y'all don't know my life. You know, I don't want to live under the shadow of what people could think, even though looking at it is kind of careless. Yeah. You're like, I'm with a whole woman. I, at least make an at announcement. Least in the, at least in the public eye. Yeah. For sure. Make an announcement. Me and my wife respect our privacy. We have decided to dissolve our marriage. And then whatever they see you at that point on. Yeah. It is at, what that, it is. at that point, it was, um, again, this ain't no excuse, man. It just, I'm just living and learning in real time. Of course. Um, there's some grief there with the kids because we also getting ready to go into Christmas, the first one without the children. And then also actually divorcing is still painful. Even if you grew apart, you don't love the person no more it's romantically. Death, no matter how you look at it, it's a death. It's been over a year since I started that detachment, but I still was feeling some of it. Um, but ultimately I was trying to be rebuilt up. I didn't went around feeling like the world's greatest big bad wolf. I wanted to be around people that loved me and cared about me. And yes, some of that included feminine energy that just at least liked me as a human. Right. You know, it's not even about sex. It's like, man, do you, you even smile whenever you look at me? Yeah, you know, I've been coming into rolled eyes and you know, somebody walking when she's hear me coming in, she walk understandably, by the way, let me say that. Right. There's a but lot of built-in failure, a lot of mismanagement of our heart, mismanagement of all that. And then Disappointment, like, trauma, um, reiterating the trauma, and, you know, so many different things going on. Probably some stuff apart from me that ain't got nothing to do with me as well. So I understand it, but two things can be true. I understand it, and it was effed up. It was 100%. messing me up. No, who who wants to sit in that? That's why most people get divorced. That's why most people say, I'd rather just start over fresh. I'm going to take these lessons I've learned and then I'm going to try to do better in the next marriage. But this right here just ain't working. My mentor told me though, man, you got that for five to seven years. He was helping coach me through it. I had prepped my mind to be able to endure that. It just was still tough. The reason I actually got a divorce was because I'm like, she's not, she's not able to do what needs to be done with her mom. And when she treats me a certain way, there's another person involved that gets treated a certain way because there's another person that is connected that, to how that, she feels about it. That's a puppeteer that, that's pulling the strings. To a degree. No, not that. There's another person that, okay, I don't know how to say this, but I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. So our eldest daughter, she may have spoken on this, is darker than the other two. Oh, yeah, she said that. She said she didn't usually like that. She she. She says she didn't like that daughter. She had a lot of resentment towards that daughter. So me, like in the house as an infant, as a toddler, because she's saying it, and I don't think 
you might not understand like this. What is, it looked like in real in time. In real life, oh, these oh, are experiences. I, I can imagine what it looked like. So um, me, I could often intervene or kind of settle things out because I know that she loves that girl. I right. know that she loves her children. But it was affecting their relationship and how she treated her or how harsh she was or how she talked to her. And I got that from what she's saying. She's saying that when somebody says that they don't like their child because the dark skin of this child reminds them of the type of women that you preferred, then... It's a different level. It's a different level. And I level. didn't understand it, but I, again, with Grace, it's just like, you know, even she's saying she's trying to work against it. So, all right, you know, family business. We're going to work through this. But... I'm the one that saw the one, the two-year-old go for affection to their mommy and get turned away while the other two light skin or the other one light skin at that time child gets all the love and affection and the dark skin child to see that. I'm the one that hears our dark skin child say things reflective of how she feels mommy feels about her. Mm -hmm. um, so when, as everything was in a stagnation or regressing, it wasn't just me getting pushed away or treated a certain way. Yeah. And again, I, I really hope people just tr approach this with compassion because I don't think any of us manage all of our emotions perfectly. Of course not. And she's done a ton of sacrificing for every one of those kids. And I just need to say that because she's not a bad mom. Right. Um, but I said the longer that I stay in this space knowing that she's not going to do what I need her to do um, and that therefore that's, that stunts her healing, our reconnection, the longer she's getting put through that. The longer the kids are getting modeled, the disconnection, the resentment and tension remaining. Um, I don't know if she was talking to her mom at that point, but without her making that stance and saying, we committed over here, we were not moving forward. So anytime she got triggered, anytime I put whatever, she, that it, it was two people receiving the brunt of that. And somebody had to draw a line and say no more. I can respect that. I can respect that. Because what you did is give more context behind what she even admitted. And I believe that what you said, she will never deny. She'll say, yep, I that, that was but she's yeah man but with all of that because one thing I noticed um, and I hope she don't mind me saying this is that sometimes she dealt with shame of feeling like she wasn't perfect she cried about sometimes how she dealt with our daughter um, she had a lot of insecurities as a woman but also as a mother and so I hope that she knows that it doesn't take away from her love for the kids her sacrifices for the kids the things even now I don't see because we've been co-parents now almost a year so there's many things she has to take on now that we may be used to split that's just strictly on her and including our third child, you know. So for anybody, any mom out there that, that resents their kids for any reason, there's some people that just mad they became parents. Yep. You know, it became such a burden. And there's mothers and fathers that deal with that guilt of knowing they don't feel less happy about something that, you know what I'm saying, the kid is involved, but they can't talk to nobody. And yep. what I'm saying is, you know, is it don't take away from that. And she's still, her love is still genuine. And she's still a good woman. That's good. I'm glad you you said that, which goes back to this Mother's Day post that you made. Mm -hmm. What made you do that? And I believe that while it's good intentions, for whatever reason, people didn't receive it as such. When you look back, hindsight been 2020, why you believe that that wasn't received well? Well, Shade Room didn't receive it well, and the blogs didn't, but people on my page did. However, you know, um, I caught wind that she wasn't happy with it. That was my third year post on Mother's Day. For me, and I'm not saying it was the right decision, but the romantic relationship is completely separate from the co-parenting relationship. True. So I honored her in real life before Mother's Day about her being a mom. I would send her text to say, thank you for taking on that, especially if the kids went to urgent care or something. Thank you for being the one to take care of that. Thank you for being there, taking off whatever you might be doing for work. So in real life, I honored her. And actually, her mom was there. I brought her flowers. I had the kids pick something up. The it, day before, she told me that. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a regular thing, though. As co-parents, I'm like, we may have, you know, our chapters closed romantically, but we still are teammates when it comes to them. She said the reason why it was kind of backhanded uh, compliment is because you blocked her on social media. So how can you block somebody but then make a message or uh, an affirmation post without them quote unquote seeing it. So I had to block her because before y'all interview, she was throwing around our picture online. She was in her story. She had a whole webinar called the cheating husband stories. It was like, when I saw that you had titled it breaks her silence, I was like, broke what? It was already broken. Cause she had been, but for me, I wanted to allow her, her she want to express or tell her, her story that I don't deserve a space to speak on what's valid and what's not. Um, and so I was kind of letting her do a thing, but I can only handle so much. If she's doing all of this, people are sending, sending, sending. So I blocked her. Like, I can't handle that. And I don't want to start retaliating or, you know, whatever, speaking as well. 
So I didn't say anything about her at all outside of Happy Mother's Day. But I honored her in real life. I honored her on loud, um, out loud online the same way I had the two years prior um, because it was separate. And I meant everything I said in there about her being a great mom. But yeah, I had blocked it and I unblocked it because I was trying to tag her, but her settings won't let me tag her. But yeah, that was it. And I took it down when, I, you know, she's not comfortable with that. Fine. No big deal. Yeah. Um, and be honest with you, I wasn't following her around to know what she was saying about you. And and all sincerity, like which I told her, which I had to do a pre-interview, I didn't, I questioned her mental stability. So I didn't want to bring on the podcast and explore it. I was like, something, something is off with her. So then when people kept saying, you need to talk to her, then I talked to her on the phone and I was like, oh, she really cool. She really cool. Well, all right, well, come on. Because if, if she was dealing with any type of mental illness and that type of stuff, I didn't want to exploit that. Yeah. And so when I was talking to her, I said, oh, she funny. She cracking jokes. Because even when she would talk about the infidelity, she'll be, she'll, she'll be joking about it which made me feel like she was so far removed that she was healed from it. Because I yeah. would say, if you can laugh about something, and she was like, yeah, they were passing the hallway. Yeah, I was getting me. I was one of the girls. So I like it when people get to the place where they can laugh at some of their dumb decisions and be able to acknowledge what was right, what was wrong, and talk about her own faults in it or whatnot. And so that's what made me say, all right, come on, Dear Future Wife Podcast and have this conversation. Yeah, she ain't crazy. She just, she uh, she's different and in, in She's like an awkward black girl. Yeah. And then also, we I mean, I hope everybody understands she's been, and I had to understand this myself, she's been brought to some limits that, you know, I wouldn't wish most my worst, people would, Most people would, would fold somehow. Yep. So there's no blueprint on how to handle this. When she first met me, I was a college football player and I loved to write poetry, but that was it. And now I've become this kind of sort of household name, especially in the black community. Her friends, family, coworkers, cousins, yep. they posted about me and wanted to do it. Like she's gotten kind of thrust into something I don't know if either of us knew was going to happen. Right. Nor do I think she really would have signed up for. Her. Um, so no, there's no blueprint in how she's handling everything. There are certain things she's done I still think is kind of crazy. I mean, just keeping the G with you. Um, whenever she said God took over her body and told the demon in me that I was going to die and go broke, I was like, that is bizarre. I'm not safe here. But the girl ain't crazy, What, what do you think about when she made the post that you was talking about, about people who speak negative about you, that God was going to kill their kids and everything else? I was confused because she wouldn't talk to me still. Um, so... Cause she was acting like y'all was y'all was Team Jackson. We was not Team Jackson, and I was like, "Huh?" Like, cause anytime trying to just have a cordial conversation, she was she wasn't interested. And I was like, "Okay, well, this is her boundary." Now that I've you know what I'm saying moved out the house or whatever, but then when I saw that, I was like, "You would think we were still yeah. married, and she got my back or whatever." And how I've kind of made sense of it now is maybe it was just kind of a little bit of both. Maybe it is, I don't rock with you or whatever, but maybe she was treating it as because we're legally still married, or maybe she had some hope or something like that. She's not going to just cover me in prayer. She's going to cover uh, She's going cover herself in prayer, but me as well. And that's warfare prayer, man. Like, I understood it, um, and that's light compared to what I've gotten in real life. That ain't got, that was PG, that was safe, that was Barney. Well, it offended a whole lot of people. Because he was talking about <clears throat> killing their kids and God's going to do this. I said, I know God loves you. What I looked at it when I saw it, I was like, I know God loves you, Danae, and God loves Derek and y'all are all his kids. But I promise you, if he didn't just start killing people for killing his own son, he sure ain't going to kill him for, for, for talking bad about you and Derek. But she learning, man. She, um, I mean, you want a war in the spirit. Yeah. You want to speak against those things that are trying to operate against God's plan for your life. But I think that, you know, like she's just still sharpening that. But right. she, she meant well. That's all. And so um, y'all are still, y'all still going through a divorce now? Is the divorce final? No, we moving it along as fast as we can, but it's still a process. And no, so legally we are still married. And um, do you desire to get married again? Absolutely. Why? Because I don't think your past has to dictate your future. I don't think just because you failed at something, maybe you were the one that sabotaged and injected up like me, or maybe you just was a wrong, you got done wrong and you know, you endured it. But I don't think we have to look at how things went in the past at any point and say, never again will we ever have a chance. I still value marriage. I still value family. Um, I understand some things now I didn't before. Not only understand, I've prepared differently, and I'm, I'm preparing going into it again. But when the time comes, I ain't in no hurry. Right. But I want to make sure when God aligns my person, you know, she gets the best of me. And, you know, we don't repeat the same issues as the past. When you um, do you look at yourself as being single now even though you're legally married yeah yeah and so you move like a single man um to a large degree I'm, I'm moving like a single man who's focused on his children and his um his healing and personal growth 
So, you know, I may spend time with people I wouldn't normally spend if I was in a marriage, but um, I'm not developing anything towards nothing. Um, I got my focus really on my kids because, like, again, we've been co-parents for the last almost year. And it's them who didn't choose to be a part of any of this. Anything you want to leave the audience with? What would you what would you like to say? What's on the heart of Derek Jackson? And what would you like to say, whether it's to, matter of fact, I don't even want you speaking to the women. I want you to speak to the brothers that may be in the same situation as you've uh, been in, feel like, you know, they've tried, they've uh, mismanaged their marriage, cheated, whatever. What would you say to those brothers that, as they always say, when he can't tell me nothing when we've been in them shoes before? Um, first off, you're not alone. You're not alone in how you cope. You're not alone in what you struggle in. You're not alone in that guilt and shame. You're not alone in feeling unheard and unseen and like you don't matter. You're not alone in feeling like, you know, you're just about being a good behavior and everybody wants you to do right. And don't nobody care if you're okay. You're not alone in feeling like, you know, your woman can use her intuition to see if you're cheating, but she ain't using that same intuition to see if you're at peace and if you're happy. There are other men who feel the same way. I felt the same way. And let me also say, it's not always somebody else's fault. I don't even believe in relationship problems as much as I used to. I believe we have internal problems that we bring into a relationship. So for everything that you're feeling, even though you're not alone, your wife, your girl, she ain't the enemy either. She ain't the cause either. And if you're like me and you're reactive, you're apart from your masculine role. We're supposed to be the standard. Femininity is supposed to be the responsive agent. So what that means is instead of getting in a relationship thinking like me, I'm speaking from where I feel like I really dropped the ball. So hopefully you don't instead of feeling like, well, long as she do me right and pour into my cup and so on and so forth, I'm going to do right. That's a recipe for disaster, man. Of course, you don't want to do a good woman wrong, but it should be about you being a good man to your standards, your principles, regardless of that woman's behavior. And if she's not good enough to do right by probably best to go ahead and let her go. That's not me preaching. That's me hopefully trying to reach somebody you know, who still has a family and you have the opportunity to keep that intact or you have the opportunity to keep it from suffering such humiliation and such damage before, you know, it eventually fizzles out. Um, And honestly, I will speak to women as well as men. No matter what decisions you've made, if you've been the villain like me or the victim like I have at times as well, don't let that define your ambition going forward. You may have messed up, but you still have you have value to offer this world and you got value to offer somebody in love. So maybe it was a part of a pattern like me and you stepped out and that's the big sin. But maybe you had a pattern of sabotage. Maybe you had a pattern of overreacting, never trusting, closing down, whatever your pattern is. It doesn't have to be your future. And that's for any woman that then chose the wrong man over and over again, endured the wrong thing over and over again, or any man that's endured the wrong thing over and over again or chose wrong, et cetera. That's all. There, you know, some giftings are given without repentance. But I'm telling you, you you got a gift for this thing. You really do. You have a gift, and and I, I'm just listening to you. And the reason why, and I text you when I um, did the episode with Danae, and I said, "Hey, listen, this episode is going to drop. I'm gonna keep you lifted up in prayer because the the thing that I'm trying not to get emotional." The worst thing that I want to be is the catalyst that sends another person, a brother, a human being over the edge. And so I'm sensitive to my to the giftings, the 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 platform that God has given me. And so I'm sensitive to the fact that even though this brother, because the thing about it and I'll, I'll level with you, if I had a platform. When I was at my worst point, when I was married. Probably would have looked at like 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 people looked at you. It just so happened that I didn't have the platform when I was cheating on my wife. Now, of course, I could say, well, I wasn't also over here giving relationship advice or whatever. But I'm saying, if my worst day was televised, how would people look at me? If our worst day is publicized, how would people look at said individual? And so, I offer people the same grace that I know that God extends to me. And so, I text you that day and I said, listen, brother. I want you to get your healing. I want your family to be healed. I want your family to be restored. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you and I love you. Because at the end of the day, you still my doggone brother, no matter what. (laughs) And then when I found out that you're a brother in Christ, you really my brother. And so what I say to you, King, is that 
I'm standing 10 toes down. I want to see your family healed, restored. I want to see y'all have the best co-parenting relationship ever. I want y'all to be able to uh, um, go to lunch together and dinner together. And people are like, are they back together? Like, no, this is what healthy looks like. Yeah. This is what healthy looks like. Yeah. And instead of passing on generational curses, I want us to pass on generational healing. So I want that for you and Denea. Uh, I pray that God continues to heal those beautiful uh, kings and queens that y'all are raising up so that they could see a healthy relationship relationship, see what healthy co-parenting looks like. Absolutely. Um, and that's what I want for y'all. That's what I'm praying for y'all. Matter of fact, I'll just end in prayer. Heavenly Father, I lift up the Jacksons before you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for my brother coming on this platform and bearing his heart, bearing his soul, showing up 10 toes down. And for him to even name the episode, you reap what you sow. He has been totally transparent and honest about how he's been showing up and the lack thereof. And God, I hope this episode touches the hearts and the minds of the people that witness it, those that are coming just to see some sensationalize uh, a story to be able to pick out sound bites to attack uh, your, your people. God, I ask that you convict their hearts and they're able to see, okay, God, I see it now. I understand, you know, and I want us to be able to offer each other grace, grace, God. And we thank you. We thank you for uh, their relationship, the even the demise of the relationship. We God, we thank you because all things work together for the good of them that love God and to the call according to your purpose. So, God, there's also a lesson in this. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Derek, thank you so much. And thank you. For being Appreciate on the Future Wifey Podcast. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into child protective services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just two many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, 
with much remorse. I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTerris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. I know a lot of y'all may have your feelings or opinions about why I decided to interview Derek Jackson. Well, I believe that the Dear Future Wifey podcast was or is a platform that curates conversations that allow a safe space to be created. Um, this is a season of tough topics. What better guest to have than Derek Jackson on this season? And so I thank y'all those that were able to stomach these uh, two episodes because a lot of y'all were saying, I'm not going to watch it, but I know curiosity killed the cat and y'all decide to watch anyway. Thank y'all so much for rocking with us. Um, it's interesting. You know, I'll call Danea, talk to her, ask her, you know, fact check some things um, through her, find out what was, the, what was the truth, what was the lie. Um, or just a misrepresentation of one's experience. Because sometimes people have an experience and not realize that that didn't quite happen like that. And so it is what it is. But listen, uh, I thank God for the opportunity to allow men to share their hearts. And if this episode triggered you, if you have been um, entangled in the web of narcissistic abuse, I pray that you find healing. I pray that you get therapy and counseling so that every mention of the word narcissist or any uh, introduction to a person that has those characteristics doesn't trigger you, that you can actually listen and engage and say, that's what I'm not going to allow myself to get involved in again. Um, to my understanding, Derek has not been diagnosed with narcissistic uh, disorder, um, MPD. Um, so we're not going to just throw labels around. I do believe that, uh, he's just, has been a very manipulative person. Um, that's what he's been in the past. Hopefully he's been delivered, set free from that and aims to do better in his life. Can't do nothing but hope for the best. So there's that. Uh, to any victims of, he talked about suicide and how he was very suicidal, to those who uh, may have struggled or may are struggling with suicide ideation, I pray that you get help from that. I pray that you go through therapy, get counseling from that. Um, those that may use suicide as a manipulation tactic, I pray that you find other coping mechanisms. Um, you know, I just pray for healing and restoration for us as a people, um, not just black people, but just people, the human race healing, restoration. I serve a God that is a God of redemption. So that's what I'm believing for. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. Dear future wifey, I will honor you in speech and actions. I will consecrate my flesh daily to kill not only the spirit of infidelity, but even the propensity to make any fleshly decisions that will impact handling your heart improperly. Our marriage will require work, but we are equipped to handle it. We are also wise enough to lay our burdens at the feet of Jesus and humble enough to consult the couch of therapists. I come against the spirit of pride before it takes root in our minds. I cut it off at the root. Let's love each other beyond past trauma and become a home of healing and a place of fulfilled purpose. Your future hubby.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.